Rob doesn't understand the lengths we go to. The lengths we go to. <laughs> make, make a show happen. Oh, I don't have my music app open. Hold on. There it is. Here we go. Hello, this is Lawrence Lewis. And this is Sister Christian. Today is Thursday, August 6th, 2020. This is the Producers Happy Hour, a weekly podcast with two producers on opposite coasts. Christian is in New York City. I'm in Los Angeles, and we're exploring what it means to be good producers as we come out of this global shutdown of our industry and try to figure out how to get everyone back to work safely while still navigating the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, yeah, I mean, we find ourselves being asked to take on greater responsibilities from a variety of guidelines created by multiple sources. Now more than ever, it's important for us to keep sharing our experiences and ideas and how it's going out there. And the only way we can do that is by sharing the information that we all learn individually. So email us or better yet, record a one to two minute voice memo and send it to us at producershappyhour.com. Tell us your story. Let us know what you're doing, how you're keeping your crew safe, or as a crew member, how do you feel you're kept safe? Follow the instructions on our website on how to send us a voice memo at producershappyhour.com. And please share the show with your friends, your colleagues, your COVID compliance officer. We want these stories <laughs> to be heard. They're important. Um, they're going to help us get back to work, but also to stay working. Because the goal here, folks, is to do it right so that we don't have to shut down again. Exactly. And funny you mentioned COVID compliance officer, Christian, because today we have two of them on our podcast. Oh, we do? <laughs> <laughs> we do. <laughs> funny so that you should, yes. Two guests today. One we've had is a return guest. We try and, you know, vary it up. But Josh Jupiter, who was on our show back in the shutdown days, he's a producer, production supervisor. He's recently been certified as a COVID-19 compliance officer lovingly referred to it as CCO. He recently did a job working under a location manager that we both know, Teddy Yoon, who is also now a CCO, and he worked a job as a CCO with Josh. And they're here to chat with us about it. Yes, it's a very interesting story that they have. It was, you know, just briefly um, in New Jersey and outside. It sounds like, though, part of what I experienced is similar to what they experienced is, you know, people are just you know, they need to be told continuously the working conditions that they have to do their job under now. And it's a change, but we have to have compassion and explaining to people that there's a new way that we have to work. Yes. And, and it I keeps think, us all safe. Exactly. And I think the, the frustration is palpable in the interview, <laughs> which I'm sure many of our listeners can share in that because yeah, we're all just trying to figure it out. There's no one really leading the ship, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> we, we all have to, you know, dive into the research ourselves, yeah. understand how the virus works and, mm -hmm. you know, do mm -hmm. your best to keep yourself safe. And I'm not saying that to say that producers should skirt any of the requirements. I'm just saying it's kind of every man for himself right now. Yeah. And we can't because we're the leader. Yes. Between, you know, us, the AD and the director, because more and more EPs aren't coming to the shoot. We don't have agency coming and we don't have clients. So more than ever, we are the production leaders of the set. So we need to be the ones who set the standards and goals. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So Christian, I know you've been busy working yeah. on a couple projects. <laughs> How are you holding up? What's going on? Well, I'm a little defeated, to be honest. There's a lot more and it, and it just comes from explaining things more. Mm. It's the continual troubleshooting to work out different scenarios and problems that may arise due to either the lack of either the creative needs to be adjusted, more mm. shoot days need to be added because the things you cannot add are crew and time to your day. Yeah. And, you know, the continual explaining or the ideas that come up and then you go back and <laughs> it's just, it, there's a lot of back and forth way in advance of the job and sometimes in advance of the award. And it's, it can be exhausting sticking to your guns over what is needed in order to do the job correctly. We also have to protect the money. Obviously, safety and humans are always put first. Yes. But you can't commit to doing something if you can't pay for it. Mm -hmm. 
And so exactly. that the relationship of what we had before was, yeah, hey, I got $100,000. What can you do for this? We can do this. Great. That is not how you can it's navigate the, these yeah. things. So exactly. I'm a little defeated today just from the exhaustion. <laughs> yeah, so. I can understand it since we've, God, I don't know, way back in you know, April, we were talking about the inevitable returning to work. And that was one thing we were hoping to avoid was this weird conflict of interest of us who we're hired to deliver to the ad agency and support the director and protect the production company. The only way to do it safely is by spending the money and putting safety first above all else. And it's a conflict of interest in what we've been hired to do, which is deliver for the agency protect the director and protect the production company. So it puts producers in a precarious place. It does. And I would like to talk to somebody because, you know, I am freelance and I have always been freelance, even though I have my own production company, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not well versed in, you know, contract negotiations and those types of things. I've done it, but you know, I don't have to not taking that on. So I'd like to hear from somebody about these new liability clauses that everyone's building into their contracts now, because nobody wants to take responsibility for if something happens and the shoot needs to push or cancel due to COVID-19. And it should not be on the production company because it's force majeure, whatever you want to call it. But then the same arguments being given from the agency client side of like, well, it's ne- their fault either. But yeah, I'm sorry, but these are the risks of what it takes now to do a job. So yep. why would it be the production company taking all the risk? Oh man, it's a brave new world, Kendrick. <laughs> I know. So how are you? <laughs> I'm okay. I've I've been uh, I've been fielding phone calls, work feelers, feelers and discussions about possibilities, about you know scenarios scenarios, new ideas, and help kind of, you know, troubleshooting or or just helping chat with people about jobs and what can be done more in the experiential realm. That was the basket I was putting my eggs into before the coronavirus Mm -hmm. came out, made her debut. So that whole sector of, you know, I'm going to still call it film production because there's always a film component to it. That whole sector is kind of a little lost into, you know, what can we do? that is as impactful as a live in-person experience was uh, that was filmed for commercial use, right? So yeah, a lot of discussions, talking to a lot of different people and coming up with a lot of ideas, but nothing's really landing. And the repetitiveness of life these days is getting a little tiresome. (laughs) I'm trying to stay off of Facebook, as I said, you know, last week or two weeks ago, whenever, but I was on in my half hour daily limit that I'm allowed. And I did see a Facebook memory from, I don't know, five, seven years ago of me and a friend. It was taken by like a press photographer. So it was a candid shot. We didn't see it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful lensing, beautiful camera of me and my friend in the Hollywood Bowl pointing at a group of friends of ours or something. And it was when Grace Jones played at the Hollywood Bowl. It was a very, very memorable night. We all knew each other. Everybody right. was there. All your friends were there. It was mm-hmm. a it was a legendary night, and uh, it made me really miss concerts. Yeah, live events. Mm-hmm. Live events. Seeing massive amounts of friends in one place for an event, mm-hmm. and then talking about that event for the next you know seven years. Yeah, that's that is a real bummer. I miss art galleries and museums, and yeah, this sucks. It it does. I mean, thinking about it and how we've um, we've adapted to this life as we do. We're survivors, yeah. you know. Yeah. But this the simple, you know, uh, not being able to hug somebody or you know, I'm a toucher. <laughs> Anyone mm-hmm. who knows me, and it just I miss it so much. Speaking of Facebook, right? I, I've never <laughs> been a big fan because it just feels like it's too much. But when this whole thing went down, it kind of felt like the town square that we needed, right? Yeah. And so we follow these. We're in Where Spot. We're in Hollywood. Reopening, reopening, reopening Hollywood. Hollywood. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. And a few other groups, and we have our own. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Producers Happy Hour. Please go and join. Look this up. 
and like us. <laughs> <laughs> but there has been like, you know, an ad boycott because of Facebook saying, sure, Russia, come on in and buy whatever you want, you know? <laughs> and allowing Trump and other politicians to say whatever they want. And not fact checking them. Factual or not. Mm -hmm. And just letting that fly because they don't want to be the arbiters of truth. Right. So last month was the Facebook boycott yes. by the biggest advertisers mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. A lot of them signed up. They all joined in to boycott Facebook until they take some kind of responsibility for posts that could be seen as hate speech or disinformation. Right. And it was called the Stop Hate for Profit campaign. And it started as a way to pressure Facebook into being tougher on what the civil rights groups considered hate speech and disinformation. And Ad Age spoke with a bunch of the advertisers because now that they've made this stance. Right. And Facebook hasn't really done, done anything. a whole lot. Mm -mm. They, they claim they have, but they haven't. They've had these phone calls where mm. they gave him a lot of talking points and rhetoric, and it didn't really seem to amount to much. So now Ad Age is saying that these advertisers are saying that it is going to be tough for some of the brands to now walk back and say, okay, problem solved, it's fixed, we're back, we're advertising on Facebook again, because that's not going to go over well with their customers. Exactly. It already feels like people have forgotten about, you know, like, uh, oh, we went out and we, we marched. So yeah. racism solved. And yeah. <laughs> it feels like that, but hey, guys, no, we can still no. be doing many more things than we are currently. And because Facebook uh, didn't immediately and run out and change all of their policies that they've had for 20 years now. How long are the brands going to keep this up, keep the pressure up? Yeah. People have short one, memories. In this article on Ad Age, I'm going to put a link in the show notes as usual, but one major marketing exec for top brand who was speaking on the condition of anonymity even suggested that those boycotting brands are now screwed with what they're going to do. How do they go back? Are they going to continue boycotting? They're kind of in a really tough position. Yeah. So it's an interesting read. Well, I mean, is it that tough of a position to not be able to advertise on Facebook? I don't know. I mean, it, it really depends on the ROI of Facebook advertising, which I think right. is pretty good for everybody. And I'm sure Facebook knows that, and that's why they haven't yeah. changed. Exactly. I just wonder if our industry, you know, our big you know, commercial production companies are going to boycott actually making ads for Facebook. That would be a start, too. That would be a start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yep. All right. Well, let's get on to our interview with Josh and Teddy. But first, head over to our website, ProducersHappyHour.com. There's a tab called Do the Work. And that tab has a lot of anti-racism resources for you to educate yourself on the issues of racism that have long played our society as well as our industry. There's many links there with actionable things you can do to support the Black Lives Matter movement. And there's a bunch of petitions on there. It's the simplest thing you can do. It takes seconds to fill out a petition and they do work. They do make waves. So we want you to revisit. If you haven't already signed the Breonna Taylor petition, please yes. do. It's an ongoing fight that we need to fight for Breonna. It's an ongoing fight. Mm -hmm. Her killers are identified and they're still on the loose and they need to be taken to trial. Find that petition on that page. We'll put it up at the top for you and sign it. And that's a tiny little thing you can do that just takes seconds. Lawrence, you know, we should talk about 13th because we both watched it. Yes, we did. I have to come clean about my lack of mm -hmm. knowledge of all these realities that I either wasn't properly taught in school, didn't fully absorb it into my being, but getting this history of policing in America mm -hmm the 13th Amendment, how slavery ended, and the, the language that the Constitution uses to kind of reinvent slavery is what really happened with policing and the prison system. So that was very eye-opening for me and shocking and at the same time kind of shameful for myself, not really fully understanding that until now at this point in life. But that's what, that's what we said we're here to do, right? We're here to learn. To learn. And correct. Yes. And relearn, to be honest. Relearn. Yeah. Yes, and exactly. I think I'm not going to make an excuse right now whatsoever. I'm going to say that these types of issues are not taught properly in our schools. And this, I think that part of the learning that we're doing is that we're understanding what we should have learned. 
growing yes. up. Exactly. Because, you know, growing up in the South, in Georgia, you know, the Civil War was, a, you know, states' rights issues. It was yeah, not about exactly. slavery, which was, I mean, right. even at the time you're learning it going, this bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> but I can remember my, my Georgia history book was from like, I, I think it was a, the textbook was 1978. Oh, wow. And I'm not that old. <laughs> yeah. So we had outdated books too, because it was a pretty poor town. But the point is, is that history usually is written by the victors. In yep. this case, uh -huh. history has been written by the losers. And who writes the history? Is the white people. Well, no. Well, who, sorry. <laughs> who, ends up, who ends up writing? Yes, true. But who ends up writing the history are the winners. Right. So 13th, if you guys haven't seen it, you should absolutely watch it. But it, it explains what we should have learned. Yes. And then also, too, don't forget about our Take Action. It's a page on our website where you can go and do stuff. And the stuff we really need right now are post office and voting related. There's no way that we're going to postpone our election, but we all need to figure out a way to be able to vote safely. And so a lot of that is post office related. There's a petition there to help save the post office, sign that petition. Also, another way you can help, which helps get money to the post office, is by doing postcards to swing states. Yes. And that's the website, postcards to swing .com. I just ordered my 500 postcards. Nice. I have mine coming to my house too. They haven't arrived yet, but I ordered them about a week ago. So I bet you okay. they're backed up with requests. Right. Teddy Yoon is a New York based location manager, scout, and producer with 26 years of experience specializing in permitting, logistics, and management of film and media productions. Teddy currently lives in New Jersey and works in the tri-state area, and he's recently become certified as a COVID-19 compliance officer. Josh Jupiter is not just New York based, he's a New Yorker, born and he raised, is. exactly. <laughs> and he takes that vibe and work ethic with him to every project. When not working under his banner of Fifth Planet Films, he moonlights as a commercial line producer and production manager. Let's take a listen. Well, so Teddy, Josh, welcome to the show. And I'd love to start off by asking you both how you're doing. How's it going? You're both in New York, right? I'm in Jersey in the suburbs. So I'm oh, okay. <laughs> nice. Thanks for asking. How are you? Good. Thank you. Josh, how's it going? Repeat interviewee yeah. here. Yeah. Um, well, I'm honored to be back for a second time. Mm -hmm. I'm here in Brooklyn. Everything's as okay as it can be. <laughs> sounds about you know, right. <laughs> yeah, what I sounds do about and, right. You know, just taking it day by day. State of our entire world right now. So, yeah, Josh, thanks for coming back. We try not to repeat guests, but I know you just did a job following all the safety guidelines and whatnot. And T Teddy was your CCO, your COVID compliance officer. Is that correct? Yes. We're glad to have you both on so you can kind of tell us how that job went what you guys did, how it all worked out. Walk us through the steps because, yeah, this is new for a lot of people. So we're going to share information to people who want to figure out how to do this themselves. Yeah. And if I may, too, Lawrence, Teddy's a mm -hmm. location. Yeah. I know him from location scouting and managing. So I know that that's one of the key things that, you know, on scouts that you need to look for is the right, you know, location to make sure those are good. So, yeah, we'd love to hear the setup. Let's start with when was the job and whatever you can tell us, you know, don't want to violate any NDAs or get anyone in trouble. But when was it and where were you shooting? The job was last Tuesday and Wednesday. Mm -hmm. We were shooting down in the Jersey Shore. And a little background, if I may. Sure. I've known Teddy probably. Teddy, I guess I've known you seven, seven or eight years now. And... Mm -hmm. I've worked with Teddy a lot over the past couple of years. I value his input. I've known him to be a really great professional. And, you know, over the years, like, you know, like you and Christian, like you guys have become friends. Um, so Teddy and I have become friendly and we kept in touch during the pandemic. And he mentioned to me that he was doing the CCO thing. He had heard about the classes, heard about, you know, people needing someone on set to kind of oversee operations. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me about how he was really into it and he was doing a lot of these productions and gaining hours doing the job. 
and therefore experience. And I was really curious and I said, Teddy, bring me on. I'm curious to see what you're doing. I'm curious to learn. And he had this pretty big job going on with a headcount of 50 people. He brought me on. At first, it was really exciting. He ran me through everything from the intake to what we have to do on set, keeping things clean, talking the crew, having the proper PPE. And I really just observed throughout the day and helped them with everything that I could to really understand this process. I felt like it was so valuable for me because if someone was going to call me to produce or production manage something, I would want to know how to facilitate my job with a COVID compliance officer. So what was your role on this? Were you just shadowing Teddy? Teddy needed an assistant. Okay. Okay. And I offered to volunteer with him. He offered to pay me out of his pocket, but I was like, Dude, you don't have to pay me. <laughs> Josh, you posted early on during all this that you got your COVID compliance certificate through Coursera. Is that right? I got the contact tracing through Coursera. Oh, right. That's what it was. Sorry. And okay. I did the CCO course through health and education services. What I've heard is no one can actually legitimately get certified. It's not like a license or like an education certificate. It's just a piece of paper. You took the class kind of thing. And Teddy, let's go to you. How did you get involved in being a CCO? So let me start by saying I was never into it. As, as <laughs> I, I, I never, you know, expected the world to end up how it is. I saw it as an opportunity, not only to for myself, because I don't enjoy the job. And, I, and my wife can tell you that I've sent her multiple text messages from the first day I did it, which was like back in July 8th, that I was like, this is not my favorite thing to do. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm done with this within an hour or two. Because it's like, I want to be responsible for the crew. And I, I feel like I always have as a location manager and what jobs I think are how hard I've stood against certain decisions on set or whatever. It's paramount to me that crew is safe. Now, this, yeah. this whole COVID thing takes it to a whole nother level. It's not a car coming at you. It's a microscopic organism that the experts aren't experts on. So as the guidelines change every day, it's like you feel more and more out of control, but at the same time, you feel like your instincts take over and you kind of, every time I do it and I, tell, I told Josh this, I feel like the crew's like my kids. Like I have three kids. It's like, don't put that in your mouth. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, yeah. I know. Like I've yeah. said, if, if my new job is policing adults and explaining to them personal hygiene, then I, I can't produce anymore. <laughs> but that's the new world though. I know. And it's reminding them like, why are you guys standing so close together? It's Oh, right. Every three minutes, though. Nobody's an expert and the experts aren't experts. So everybody wants to get back to work. Everybody wants to be safe doing it from the majority of people I see, like they want to take the steps. But at the same time, they kind of don't want to acknowledge that we're in a situation which goes beyond us as filmmakers more to the point where we're like humans. As yes. to like, yep. you know, what am I putting on the table here? What could I possibly expose myself to, you know, and am I trusting the people who, you know, basically don't have any real certification? It, these are all yeah. companies that have jumped on the bandwagon of, mm -hmm. of making a dime off of like, hey, co become COVID compliant. Mm -hmm. It's like the, everything else. It's like you jump on that bandwagon, what everybody else is, what everybody accepts. But you see the fine print at the bottom of the page. We're not affiliated with any you know, outside organization. So it's like I could send you a bunch of certificates saying that yeah. you're compliant. <laughs> and you know what I mean? Like, you know, not to sneeze in my face. Right. God bless right. you. Well, a lot of it's common sense. You're right. But then there's right. also the knowledge right. behind it when you get questioned, which, you know, is valuable. Sometimes. I also think it's very systematic and, and, and quantified to the point yes. where it's like, nobody really wants to put their foot in that pool of like, Hey, yeah. we're the ones that are going to tell you what's, going to keep you safe because nobody knows do you know are you going to guarantee me i'm not going to get sick but like that's just one more thing all of us as like independent filmmakers too or subcontractors or whatever we've known this from the start if anybody's going to like really 
survive during this, you know, beyond all the essential workers and everybody else. It's like, you know, we've known this. We could not, our phone could stop ringing tomorrow. You have a plan B, like, you know what I mean? I do. Most people do that do what we do for a living. We don't want to go to that plan B, but at the same time, it's like, you know, we're all survivors and I don't know, man, it's, it's primal more now than it ever has been before. If that makes any kind of sense. It absolutely it, does, because um, I think that people are working who um, are the ones who care or can, but then there's also the people working who are the opportunist. Absolutely. I mean, that's just the world. I mean, you can't stop that. You can't police that. That's just what it is. And you kind of have to find that gray. I always tell people when I do locations, it's finding the gray, man. It's not just black and white. It's finding that gray. Well, let's set up the actual job. So it was it outdoors? Was it indoors? Did you know the production team or was it a cold call? No, I've worked with them before and, and you know, I've heard certain things and it was never my experience personally. I've always been treated okay. And I've always been given deadlines and craziness. You know, none of that, what happened is new to me. It wasn't shocking that you want to tech scout the, you know, Maybe that the other <laughs> the uh, morning the of <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like it's fine. That's what it is in this day and time. I guess I really think that they did everything because it was in fruition. So before anything, and I can't really talk about it just because I try sure. to honor you know my agreements. But it's just like they took the steps in my mind. Now the execution itself can be you know questioned, but nobody knows. So it's like everybody's just sitting there waiting for the the other shoe to drop. I think that these are the test jobs right now, right? We're all, Mm -hmm. we're getting out there. I mean, we're definitely the test jobs for the TV and the film that's coming along. Commercials are kind of like, oh, let's see what the commercials are doing. Let's get them out there with 50 people. I mean, were you guys inside or were you outside? Were you multiple locations? Like, give us just logistics. Were you like um, company moves? Everything was exterior. I mean, like switching over roles. I shy away from anything interior. My first. Oh, yeah. HSO, whatever you want to call it, job was interior in a studio, but it was like eight people. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. But going to somebody's house right now scares the shit out of me. Right. Want to do anything, that. anything interior. Because I mean, all the data points to a certain thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so you can't ignore that. But at the same time, more of my concern almost turned to medic in the fact that I wanted everybody to be hydrated and like not passing out. Because they're right. you're wearing it's hottest. Clothing. It's been hot and in New York and lately, like, guys. Real feels like one ten. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And like you can't breathe with that. People just take off their thing just to breathe. It's going back to the role of locations person, it's like you've chosen a location that's like big enough right. where hey, you give the people the option to like take off your mask and do it, take a walk. Yeah, this location was really optimal for what the production wanted to do. The shoot was all MOS. In addition to doing video, they were also doing photography. They needed actually a small kitchen. And what was really great about this location was it had an outdoor kitchen. So the crew was able to be outside the entire time. And in fact, the bathroom as well was outdoors. It was an interior, but to access it, you didn't have to go inside the house. And I thought that was really, like, really well great. Well thought out, for it sure. Was such a, it yeah. was truly a really well thought out location in right. terms of the logistics for keeping people safe. Was everyone self-drive or were there vans? Like what ha- Like So they tech scouted the day before the shoot. And I got the call sheet at 7 p.m., and said on the call sheet at 7 p.m., everyone must self-report. There is a shortage of rental cars here in New right. York, and mm-hmm. I was very lucky to have found one. Otherwise, I would have had it taken Did the ferry. Do- yeah. Wow. And it would, have, it would have taken a very long time. Then someone would have had to pick me up. Right. Everyone self-drove or took Uber. But there was really no... There was no vans and well, I mean, which is, you know, you're not supposed to. Right. So I um, I, I like the fact they didn't do vans. Yeah. 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 You're not supposed to get in a van right now. Once I switch rules to H, whatever the hell you want to call. I don't even know what you want to call it, but (laughs) when I switch over, (laughs) it's like when you put that helmet on, you're thinking this travel job, because it basically is a travel job once you're outside of any kind of public transport in my mind. 
And these days, something you have to account for as producers, as filmmakers, is the fact that everybody is encouraged to self-drive. When yep. back in the day, you're told, don't bring your crew car. Now it's like, like LA, where it's like you buy out a lot. Like that's what I noticed the difference. I work a lot in LA too. It's like you buy a yeah. parking lot. That's a New York specific thing where everyone takes public trans. Most people take public transport. Obviously, that exposes people to more vulnerability, and you bring right. that to set. So you're trying to limit that over there, right? Which um, brings up the other question of travel to and from. Did you guys set up zoning? I don't know how big your job was if it required that, but did you have people that were allowed to get into certain zones, or or, or did you not? deal with that because we had so much space it wasn't an issue of people overcrowding like a stage it was all exterior and like mm. you know everybody had their own role in their little space to live so you didn't really deal with zoning we didn't do it traditionally as like written out yeah. in the white sheet in regards to, to the locations did you have to allow more time for any sort of dressing or keeping departments separated was it longer than it would have been no, everybody was compliant i mean they were really thankful we were being stringent on certain things and around and making sure they were safe i guess but again we're mm -hmm. not nobody's a medic i'm not a medical doctor who am i to keep people safe i could do my best as like a an overpowered janitor you know what i mean like <laughs> right right you know it's it's <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, like this is like the know, best like, description cool. of our job that I've ever. Yeah. Heard. <laughs> That's a great description. Hey, yeah, I'm yeah. gonna keep you safer. I mean, it's like a microscopic organism. It's gonna go where yeah. it wants to go. Yeah. The stakes are a little higher. It wasn't about not mm -hmm. being able to pay rent. Now it's about who am I gonna get sick once I get sick? Because like us as industry people, we're, we'll power through. You get sick, you just like brush it off. You know what I mean? But it's also that mentality that kind of makes you and everybody else more vulnerable. And it's always that struggle to be the one that's working versus the one that's not working. And it's more inherently like obvious now because you want to be the ones that do it, but you also want to be the ones that do it right. The first job that I did out there, I mean, I looked at it as setting new standards. Like there are absolutely folks out there doing it correctly. And then there are folks that aren't. And I think that we'll end up being the winners because we are setting standards, right? So much is ever changing every day. And mm. oh yeah, it, everybody it, has so much other things to, to deal with. You can fight that fight like we did it the right way. But at the end of the day, it's really not going to matter in five years. You know what I mean? It's going to be like just getting everything back to a place where it's functional. Yeah. Because right now it's not really functional. It's not really functional. At all. It's not. It's a, it's well, why don't we talk about what did work? Yeah, Josh, I want to turn to you because you're coming at this from a producer production manager mindset. Right. And seeing it from Teddy's side. What did you see that did work? I felt like with everything CDC is asking and what steps need to be taken to keep people socially distanced and high touch points cleaned was optimal and maximized as best as it could from the COVID compliance officer's point of view. That's what I saw. And what I felt eventually happened, my point of view turned to viewing everything as a facade, as we have this person who is managing the compliance and it looks good on a call sheet. It sounds good on calls. You see all this hand sanitizer, you see PPE, and you see this one person doing their part to tell people how to stay safe. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't see was collaboration from production. And what I quickly realized was the company that was doing the shoot was not a production company. They were an ad agency. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there are some systematic problems behind all this when it comes from, you know, a company that doesn't really think all the things all the way through, right. aren't managing the, the client expectations the way that needs to in this new normal. And us on the front lines have to deal with that downfall because it does come from the way the job germinated at the very start. Yes. If it wasn't set up properly, all the hand washing, sanitizing and masks isn't going to fix a bigger underlying problem. What I saw a lack of was participation from production. Oh, yeah. And I feel like the 
CCO needs to be brought in early. There needs to be prep time. I received a call last week and a guy was looking for a CCO and he asked me if, he could, if I could do it tomorrow, the day, the very next day. And I was like, that's yeah. not enough time. No. I feel like everything with the location that we filmed at was great and it was everything was outdoors. But what I know is when I do a job, I'm going to want to bring my CCO in for at least a minimum of two prep days, minimum, with the t- being there to tech scout and reaching out to crew, talking to crew. Christian, I heard you did that on your production recently. You did an hour phone call. With every with single key. Yes, with each and every single <laughs> It was key. a whole Sunday. I know, but um, I wanted them to know what we were doing. But I also wanted them to understand that, you know, like we were thinking about them and also wanted to know about what we may oh, have, what God. I may not be thinking about their job that they wanted me to know. Listen, I can't think of everything, even though I know how good I am. <laughs> Doesn't mean that I'm good at my job. They were just like, I, there are things that I don't know about your job that I should know. And I invite that conversation. Well, it's communication. We need increased exactly. communication. And the only exactly. way to increase communication is with more prep time. Mm-hmm. But yep. How realistic is that? That's very realistic, Teddy, if we all say, you know, like we need it. Like, I'm not disagreeing with you guys. I am 1000% behind what you're saying. But especially in these times, I'm not all rainbows and lollipops. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's like what's, what's, really neither am I. <laughs> How are we going to get through this really? Because people are going to shoot regardless. But I do think that there are going to be extra added consequences for those who cut corners and it's not going to be the law and it's not going to be self-policing or any kind of guilt. It's going to be actual consequences to not doing it correctly. Yep. And there's a saying, you're only as good as your last job. You go in blind Mm -hmm. and things don't go well. Your reputation gets thrown underneath the wheel. Well, yeah. I mean, and then, you know, there's always uh, hashtag campaigns to the brand. There's there's little things that can (laughs) be done. So then, Teddy, then to your point, what I would like to know is, is there something that you took away from the job that you did that you would like for people to know that they're not expecting? What's the hardest thing about what we're about to do? The one thing I would tell every crew member that I care dearly for is don't trust anybody else but your own instincts. Don't trust that somebody else is handling your safety. Uh-uh. Like, make sure Thank you, you are vigilant yeah. yourself, protecting yours. If you got to get out there and work, and I get that, and I respect that, do it mm-hmm. in a way that you feel like you're safe. If you got to wear a full ass Iron Man mask, do it, dude. Just maintain your own self health standards don't rely on anybody else because nobody is an expert and anybody that tells you they are is lying through their teeth so just do you like that's all i could say two words do you take care (laughs) of yourself you know to expand on that it's asking questions of production don't assume production always has it you know Mm -hmm. and also be prepared to stand up for the things that you need for your department. That's basically what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, and, and because I'm not eloquent and and like, no, you're right. That's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard you know, what you know, said and I, I turned it into different like words. <laughs> mode of interpretation, but it's like, you know, everybody's going to take care of their guys. You know what I mean? Well, the if frustration is and, there. I can hear it. And it's yeah. true. There's great crew out there and we're all like, you know, God damn it. It's messed up, dude. You know what I mean? Everything's mm. messed it up. Is. So let's take the the politics and the stigma out of it. And just like, yeah, this is a health issue. It's not anything else, but like a health issue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I so think that it's all important. Need to work. We all need mm-hmm. to get back out there. We all need to and- give people content and normalcy. But let's yeah, look out for each other. If you were offered another job right now, what would you need the job to look like in order to feel safe to accept it? So I I thought about this as a producer. I'd really want to also be the bidder and I'd want to be integrated with the creative. Mm -hmm. And I'd really want to talk to the director and say, how are we doing this? How can we think ahead? 
what can we plan? How can we keep people safe? How can we keep crew size and everything as small as possible over here and then over there? And really just a lot of integration, a lot of collaboration and the proper funding and the proper time. I feel like time is the most important thing. Yeah. And then in terms of if I were to work again as a CCO, I would, but I would work for a friend, a, a producer, producer you know. production manager that I know well, someone that's going to listen, someone that's going to collaborate, someone that mm-hmm. is going to value my advice and opinion, and someone that's going to trust me and someone that I'm going to trust as well. Mm-hmm. And with the proper prep and the proper funding and the proper time, I'm more than happy to be involved. Right. And I think that that's where we had gotten to in February as an industry was that none of that was available to us. There was not enough time for prep, not enough money to do the job and not enough collaboration going on. And so coming out of this you know, the great pause (laughs) coming Mm -hmm. out of it, we realize that that stuff is necessary to put on a successful job now. And if we don't start demanding it, then we're never going to get it. It's never going to come back. Yeah. So let's just do it. Let's just make it. (laughs) 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 Sorry. (laughs) We got to make it happen and we got to make it happen. Well, that's going back to what Lawrence said, even it's like not in a bad way, not trust who's in charge of this your health and safety it's like take your steps ask questions like you know what i mean speak up do your thing if it doesn't feel right you know so dude i don't know do you know tell me you know and i'll follow you on (laughs) you know what i mean (laughs) if i could get an offer like that every day yeah seriously i'd have at least four or five followers (laughs) But no, I I take your point because we are on our honor system and not all of us have, you know, honor. It's what we I think we all have honor. It's a different interpretation of it. (laughs) Right. You know what I mean? Agreed. Right. And so unless we're all above board and following the same guidelines and have a bit of leadership, we're not going to be able to maintain the Mm -hmm. honor system. I think more than ever, we need really strong EPs, really strong HOPs, Yeah, you know, agency producers that are just really aware of everything and a full integration of collaboration with everything to do this as well and safe as possible. And I think it's possible. And I think it's just, we need to be very aware of what we're doing, who we're working for and not so much think about ourselves, but think about others. That's where my concern is. I had the virus. I have the antibodies. I've, I've been tested three times for the antibodies. I've been making myself, you know, just aware of what I have. Mm-hmm. And I know that if I'm going to go for a walk with a friend of mine who has a compromised immune system, I'm going to be extra cautious and isolate a couple of days before I do. Mm-hmm. And I would hope the same for the people that are around me when I go to work with them. Guys, thank you so much. We could talk for hours, but we we, we got to go. Teddy, thank you so much thank for your you. input. Josh, thanks for coming back on again. Thanks for having us. So that actually, I think, verbalizes the frustration that a lot of people feel. Absolutely. I think that we all want to be able to be the ones who are doing it right. But in the end, we all have choices about the jobs we take and yep. what we have to do and yep. what we're asked to do. And, you know, what has been instilled in us as, you know, freelance production people, Mm -hmm. the takeaway, I think, is, or my takeaway from this is that great saying that I love to say, I've said it for many years, is um, just because (laughs) we're non-union doesn't mean we're non-human. And I think a lot of this is, why don't we think about what we'd like to do for our fellow human first Mm -hmm. and bring that to work with us? Because we are a family. Yeah. The people who are in charge of you may not always understand what that means. Right. So, you know, take it in, um, take your own safety into your hands. Absolutely. Teddy's frustration is is palpable. We can all feel it. And I'm sure it's going to resonate with a lot of listeners out there because it's a whole new landscape. It's a whole new landscape and we're just doing our best trying to figure it out. We've been inside for months. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> we're just venturing out. We're seeing, you know, people we love, but we're also understanding that our way of life has changed entirely. And the, the, these are the first examples of it happening. So, you know, we have to have a little compassion for each other. Absolutely. All right, Lawrence, guess what? Rob what? Bloomkey. <laughs> Rob Bloomkey edited and co produced this show. Artwork and logo design was done by Christopher Daniels. And our music was composed by Kyle Puccia. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks to you all for listening. We're back next week, as always. Until then, stay safe, stay connected, stay active. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Clean your phone. Wear a mask if you go outside. And um, remember that we're all human. Exactly. Send us your voice recordings, your stories, your emails to producershappyhour at gmail.com. So important. And Lawrence, if people want to reach you, how can they? Oh my God, so many ways. <laughs> multiple. Voice of, multiple. <laughs> LawrenceTLewis.com, VoiceOfLawrence.com. For voiceover work, Christian, how about you? SisterChristianProducers.com. Bye. Bye. See you later.